the Ute are kind of in eastern Utah, coming over the Wasatch into the northern part of the the state and down to, you know, about Cove Fort, Cedar City sort of area. The Paiutes are down mostly in the southeast part of the state, uh, maybe extending a little further east in the very southern part of the area and maybe a little bit further to the north on the very western area. And the Navajo are just down really in the Four Corners area, primarily south of the San Juan River, although there's good records of them being up into the Bears Ears and maybe a little bit of further north up into Elk Ridge area as well. So, uh, but, but mostly their primary population, I think, was down south of the San Juan River. So again, we're talking about styles here. And uh, I, these are just some things that we think about when we come to a panel and we're trying to determine style. We start with the motifs. What do we see in the panel? What's there? And then we think about geographic location, who lived in this area. Can we see associated artifacts here? Is there pottery? Are there arrowheads? Um, we look for relative dating. Is there superimposition or you know, multiple pecking with different levels of repatination or different positions on the, on the panel. So sometimes you might have something lower or higher than the main panel because of the way things were situated earlier. Also, we look at painting and pe pecking and painting techniques and temporal diagnostics. So if you see a bow and arrow, that means that the panel had to be done after about 500 AD. If you see a horse, that has to be after contact with the Spanish, so after about 1680, or cultural diagnostics. Are there things that are unique to a particular culture that we can identify? And we'll show you some of those as we come along later. Don't think in absolutes, or don't use yeses or nos, but think about waiting. So, you know, you may say, gee, you know, we're not here in a Barrier Canyon geographic location. This could never be a, a Barrier Canyon panel. But those people moved around a lot. So even though you know it might not be the perfect geographic location for the Barrier Canyon people, you have to look at all of these other things and say, you know, it could still be a Barrier Canyon panel. And don't be dogmatic. Style varies over time by region and by artist. All right, so let's talk about the Ute rock art. And I'm going to describe the Ute rock art with what I think are the two most famous Ute panels in Utah. The interesting thing about all of these styles, the, the Ute, the Paiute, the Shoshone, and um, the Navajo is none of the principal authors about, about rock art in Utah have, have ever written about them. So Sally Cole hasn't written about them. Uh, Polly Shaftsma didn't write about them. Ca uh, Castleton didn't write about them. So they, none of those people defined the styles. So it's, it's rather interesting. The styles have been, been defined in other places, but not necessarily in Utah. So this is Sago Canyon, it's a public site, so we can give it a name. And what we can see here are some uh, important cultural diagnostics that are uh, really frequent with the Ute. Let me get my pen going here. So we can see horses, and we can see buffalo, more horses, and horses over here. We've got this pretty shield, two pretty shields here. And then I think this figure here might be holding a rifle. Uh, that's a little hard to tell, uh, but that's a possibility. And we know this is a really important panel because Jesus has been here. Um, so anyway, these are, these are some things that I look at uh, that I identify Ute rock art with, especially the buffalo, the horses, and temporal diagnostics like rifles and cowboys and things like that in the rock art. Um, okay. There we go. Now, I think this is the other really famous Ute site. This is Newspaper Rock State Park down near Canyonlands. 
And this is a really wide panel. And so I kind of stitched two pictures together to, to kind of give you a, a broad panoramic view of, of the site. And again, you see uh, lots of bison. So we've got bison here. We've got bison here or buffalo, same thing. Uh, we've got, anyway, there's, there's more bison running around here. Then we've got riders on horses. Oh, that's not a rider on a horse. That's a, a rider on a sheep, which probably they're not riding. There's bison over here. And then we've got a really interesting temporal diagnostic in the middle of the panel. I think this is a cowboy with a cowboy hat and chaps. And maybe, maybe it's a cavalry guy with a, a sword. Um, but anyway, there's a, a lot of interesting things. More, more, more buffalo here, more riders here. Anyway, there's, there's lots of really good temporal and cultural diagnostics here. The other thing that you see in this panel that I think we see a lot in Ute panels are bear paws. And the Utes had an important dance in the spring called the bear dance, and they really seem to like bears. And so we have bear paw up here, and oh, there's bear paw down here, bear paws over here, bear paw over here. So again, lots of bear paws, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well with a, a bigger bear that they have in the picture. Um, so the question is, you know, and most of the other styles that we've talked about in the previous three uh, presentations, we've defined the style mostly by what the anthropomorphs look like. And I have a really hard time doing that with Ute. Um, and so we've got anthropomorphs here. We've got some really big kind of blocky people over here that are interesting. But, you know, we've also got kind of long, thin people and long, thin people. And, you know, I don't know. I kind of wonder if this is a cowboy again with those kind of curvy legs. I'm not sure about that. Um, but it, it becomes much more difficult for me to find kind of consistent uh, motifs within the uh, Ute rock art that I can look at and I can say, oh, you know, that's definitely something that's Ute because I can look at that anthropomorph and I recognize it. The other thing is, you know, all of these things are historic period. So they're after they've come into contact with the Spanish. And in this case, it's after they've come into contact with white people. And, you know, that makes it really easy because we can look for horses and buffalo. And one of my questions is, is there pre-contact rock art in the Ute? And is it just that I don't know what to look for because I don't see the horses and I don't see the buffalo and so I don't recognize it. And, and that would be, you know, a great thing to kind of figure out. Uh, I apologize, this was taken with an old camera and it's a little bit fuzzy, but uh, this is another public rock art site. This is at the base of the trail up to Delicate Arch in Arches National Park. So this is, um, a, what is it, Wolf Wolf Ranch, something like that. Uh, the little homestead that was there. What's it called, Nina? Wolf Ranch. Wolf Ranch. And again, you know, you, you see the sheep down here and the sheep look pretty typical of any sheep panel, but then you've got the riders up on top. So you've got two riders on horses up there. And a really pretty buffalo here pecked in. And this interesting figure here, and Nina had a great observation when we were going through the, the presentation yesterday. She wonders if the anthropomorph is wearing chaps, which I thought was, yeah, that, that really could fit here. And then the other thing, um, you know, the Plains Indians, they had kind of a language in their rock art. 
And if you've ever listened to any of Jim Kaiser's presentations, you know, he can interpret a lot of these things. And I wonder if this hand that's kind of here in the middle is a capture hand. He would talk about that. And so I wonder if this figure on the left is capturing the horse on the right, but I don't, you know, I don't really know. And then again, we've got a, an interesting panel with your prototypical sheep, but then you've got the buffalo over here on the left. And in the, the top left corner, you have a, a horned anthropomorph, or anthropomorph on, a, on a horse with a huge big spear uh, that's coming out and looks like they're going hunting. And this is down in the Moab area. And this is a, a bear panel. And you can see that it's superimposed over uh, a lot of the earlier uh, Anasazi rock art that was here. So again, I think this is temporal diagnostic for, you know, perhaps a, a later Ute panel in this area. All right, so this is my final Ute picture. And most of us will recognize this. This was Urara's old logo. It's in Nine Mile Canyon. And you might be wondering, why are we showing this and saying that it's a Ute panel? And I have to admit, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I would have said it was a Fremont panel. But I think it was Lane Miller who pointed out to me the pecking on the owl. And especially if you look at the bottom part of the body, down in here, you can really see how wide and deep those peck marks are. And they don't look like they've been made with a stone or an antler. They look like they've been made with a metal tool. And again, you can just, you know, you can see it up in here and you look up at the top. Um, and, you know, it really looks like a metal tool was used to make this, this figure. So that places it, you know, really quite in a modern context. And given that it's in Nine Mile Canyon, which is a common place for Ute rock art, and that it's used with a metal tool, I think this is very likely to be a Ute rock art site. And it's interesting because we're going to talk about owls at the end of the presentation, so just kind of keep that in mind. Oh, I forgot about this one. This is my last slide for the Utes. So the other thing that I said was that I think that the Utes like to place rock art uh, at existing sites and they like to mimic styles. And so this is in uh, the San Rafael Swell and there's a Barrier Canyon site just to the left of these figures. And you can see the, the panel on the left here, the, you know, it's a red in color and the Barrier Canyon is red. They may have actually done some superimposition here over Barrier Canyon figures. And I think they tried to make it look like Barrier Canyon, but the style doesn't quite look right and the paint doesn't quite look right. And then there's about 10 more feet of figures and then it comes over here to this right-hand panel. And here's kind of the piece de resistance. If you look at the bottom right, um, you can see that there's a buffalo head and that may be a skull or it may be a buffalo head hat. Um, but I think once you see the buffalo and you see these kind of mimicry that doesn't look quite quite right, you know, I think this is a good example of you rock art being played where somebody had previously put rock art and they looked at it and said, well, this has got to be an important place. We'd like to, to do our own rock art here. So it's not clear to me if there's Ute rock art prior to contact with the Spanish. I'd love to figure that out. Uh, it's mostly defined by cultural and temporal elements, things like the horse, the buffalo, bears. Shields, not so much because we sh see shields in previous rock art styles. Uh, there's some depictions of modern events, you know, for example, cowboys. And there's some, a couple of great panels where they were drawing um, treaties. And... Um, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Ute chief had gone to Kansas City to sign a treaty and uh, did a rock art panel showing the train and the houses in Can Kansas City. And finally, there's uh, reuse and mimicry of existing sites and use of metal tools in some of the recent rock art. Okay, Nina. Paiute. Um, the Paiute people 
kind of came from California and moved in through southern Utah, southwestern Utah. Uh, in the earlier days, like in the 14, 1500s, they extended over into the San Juan, but they were pushed out by the Navajo. And so basically what we've got is southern, southwestern Utah rock art here. This one you can see, um, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful panel and it's uh, really lightly patinated. That's one of the ways you can tell that it's Paiute. And the Paiute generally will mimic the styles of earlier, like Glen Canyon Fiber or um, Great Basin Curvilinear Anasazi. They mimic that style, but they do, they do a little bit of their own interpretation on it. So this is what we've got um, over here by the Gunlock Reservoir. And their people that they make are full body people and they're uh, totally packed and so they look like they're healthy is what I would say rather than a stick figure they're they're a full bodied person okay this is uh, a public site this is called Little Black Mountain and it's just over the Arizona border you can see that these people came in after Anasazi were here and they put their images right over the top of the Anasazi images. This is a really, really special place for the Paiutes. It's right on the trail that takes you from the Vermilion Cliffs over into Las Vegas. There's only one way to get through the mountains easily and that's through the Virgin River Gorge. And this actually this great big straight line that you're seeing running through this panel points you right to the Virgin River Gorge. And so you've got these, uh, they, there's a few birds in the Paiute rock art that are really, really well done. You've got spirals, you've got sheep that are really not uh, identifiable as specifically being Paiute. They used a lot of spirals though and um, not pecked uh, not repatinated as much as the other images are. So that's one of the ways you can tell that it's Paiute. Okay. I was going to say that they used a lot of dots in their rock art, but I think the, the majority of the people that were in the Great Basin and over into Death Valley did use a lot of dots. And so I can't say that that is a diagnostic of Paiute rock art. In this particular panel, the only way you can tell that it's rock, is Paiute is because it's not as repatinated as the rest of it is. And you can see where there's a wavy line that's older and you've got a wavy line over the top of it that has a head, so it's probably depicting a snake. But they're mimicking those older symbols, okay? This is the most sacred site uh, down here for the Paiute Indians. It's right next to a Maverick gas station. Um, I got, just happened to be there when I got this beautiful bird sitting right up on top of this panel. And if you kind of use your imagination, on the right side of this big boulder, it, it, it's made to look like a face. And I don't know whether that's a natural thing or whether that's something that uh, was done intentionally but it does look like a face. And I think that's one of the things that makes this a special rock for whoever came. There's not a lot of Anasazi stuff before it. Most of the rock art that's on here is Paiute. In this case, uh, they're, they're doing mimicking sort of basket maker where they've got the little um, ear bobs on it and the stick figure body with these big square shoulders. Um, and then you've got your wavy lines again. Okay. I've seen, I've seen the natives up there all the time. There's always natives up there, you know, hiking up there, wandering around up there, and then they come back down 10 or 15 minutes later. So it's still being used up at that site. Uh, this is up closer to Cedar City. And uh, again, you've got super imposition over the top of the older stuff. One thing I've noticed about Paiute is that they will take the edge of a rock, like you see up in the top left side, where there's dots, uh, kind of like a big rainbow over the whole panel. And I see that the Paiutes used the edges of rocks like that quite a bit. Either they'll make the dots on them or they'll chip them out so that they're serrated. But uh, they do use the 
top edges of rocks quite a bit in the, in the panels that I've seen. Um, and it, you can see where they're mimicking that Great Basin style where um, the images themselves just really aren't that identifiable. Okay. Um, this is a panel where I'm trying to show you the difference between the earlier Anasazi and the later Paiute. So your earlier Anasazi is down in the bottom left, and then your later Paiute that doesn't have the patination that the earlier stuff does is up on top. And again, they're using the edge of the rock and they've made it into a snake that starts out on the left with a head and gets wavy and then it gets into that square design which is sort of like uh, what you'd see farther down into Arizona. And then they've got that beautiful bird. Okay. Um, this, I'm, I apologize for this being out of focus. This is a a panel where they've used a lot of clan symbols. Um, it is again on that pathway that goes from the Vermilion Cliffs, which if you're on the Vermilion Cliffs, that can take you clear over into, you know, the Glen Canyon area real easily. Um, but here you see starting kind of up on the top right side and working down towards the center of the picture, there's this kind of a white line and that's a lightning strike. And the lightning was real, real important. And this is gonna be, this is gonna give that boulder a real special power. And so I think that's why the rock art is here is because it was struck by lightning. You've got your stick figure guys, you've got um, some symbols that look to me like they're clan symbols, that upside down U, some of those circles with dots, the bear paw, all of those are, uh, could be clan symbols on it. And then you've also got this uh, squiggly line that looks to me like it's, you have to be in the area where it is in order to understand this, but this, is, this big boulder is right on the edge of a cliff. If you look down into the valley below, you see um, Little Black Mountain, which is the one that's the sacred site, which is on the path. And I think that dot centered circle is depicting Little Black Mountain and the zigzag is the base of the mountain itself. But, but you know, I get more into interpretation than most people do just because it's fun. And that doesn't mean that that's what it actually is, but that's what it looks like to me. Okay. That's just a close up of uh, what we were looking at a minute ago. Okay. So we're gonna recap, Paiute rock art includes both abstract and representative elements and may mimic other local rock art. It usually does. I can't really think of any specific symbol that is unique to Paiute. There's far fewer animal images than in other styles. Usually it's the wavy lines and the people and then not that many animals. Um, they don't have a consistent style to their human beings. Sometimes they're stick figures, but for the most part, they just have these great big bodies that are filled out. And they often mimic other people's rock art. Um, the, only, the best way to tell that it's Paiute is by its lack of repatination. And then they like to put their, their panels, there's, it's rare to find a panel that's just Paiute. They're all, almost always over the top of other, and they will just take like two or three figures for the most part and just put those right on top of another panel just, um, just to show that they had the presence there too, maybe. Um, they, they just like to add their stuff to everybody else's. I think that's it. Okay. So Navajo rock art was a bit of a problem for me. Um, there is Navajo rock art in Utah, but not very much. I mean, you've got to get down into the reservation on the south side of the San Juan River to see a lot, and I just haven't traveled there that much. There's a, a yay figure, which we'll talk about in a minute, that's uh, near the Twin Rocks trading post. Um, and so this is one of the few places in all of the four presentations where 
I kind of gave up and I stole rock art imagery from outside of the state. So this is all of the pictures that I'm going to show you are from New Mexico, just because it'll give you a better idea of what the, the rock art imagery looks like. So uh, here we see this beautiful anthropomorphic figure. Richard Jenkinson is going to give the next presentation and it's his highlights and he lived for a long time on the Navajo reservation and looked a lot at their rock art and so hopefully he'll do a better job at describing some of this stuff than I can but you see these long narrow bodies often with a round head and kind of a flared skirt out at the bottom and I often think the feet are kind of facing forward like in the Fremont the feet are all often facing to the side and the old Anasazi figures, the basket maker figures, the, the feet are facing straight down. But here it looks to me like the, the feet are generally facing forward. And they're just beautifully executed. This is, it's really nice rock art. And again, you can see this anthropomorphic figure with the flared out skirt and the, the long rectangular body and the round head. And it looks like there's on the top of some kind of critter down there, maybe looks like maybe it's a cat given the paw tracks beneath it. And uh, like I said, they got really into corn and they, do, they drew a lot of corn imagery and it's spectacular imagery. Uh, and when I went on this field trip, they were talking about how you can tell that there's male corn and there's female corn and they depicted it differently in the rock art and I've forgotten how you tell. Uh, but it's interesting that uh, the corn plants tend to uh, come out of a little base. And so they often have these little bases at the bottom and I don't know what that represents. I don't know if it's a seed jar or if it's a, 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 like an altar or something special, uh, but you'll see that a lot um, in the corn plants. Uh, this is a really interesting panel that looks quite different. And, and so I don't know if these are yay figures or not. They, they don't look quite right to me, but you know, triangular heads uh, with fancy headdresses and that square headed figure in the middle, they all have those kind of, uh, again, the flared skirts at the bottom with the rectangular bodies. And look at this fantastic panel here. It's just spectacular. And you've got corn plant to the left and that beautiful figure, anthropomorphic figure beside it. We've got horses and riders, another horned figure down low on the panel. And uh, again, a, a, a anthropomorphic figure on the bottom right uh, where it's coming down and then you have that flared out skirt again. The, the horses here I think are interesting. And you know, I haven't seen enough Navajo rock art to know if it's diagnostic or not, but the Navajo horses seem to be stubbier, if I can say that. They, they seem to be like, have bigger girth and shorter necks. And the other thing that Nina was wondering about is if these might be Spanish people on the horses because they have these interesting hats that they might be wearing there. And again, they might be holding swords or perhaps guns um, in their hands. But look at how well they, these figures are executed. I mean, they're just beautifully solidly packed. And then this is another panel that, again, spectacular. And the interesting thing is that this is over the top of that San Juan basket maker kind of imagery, the old basket maker style stuff. Uh, so you can see, let me get my pen out here. You know, here's an older image here. Here's an older image here. Here's an older image up here. Uh, so another one here. So there's, you know, there's quite a bit of, of older images here uh, and they have superimposed on this site. Uh, look at this beautiful figure, probably with a shield on the left. And it has a wonderful, three feather headdress 
and the feathers are just spectacularly done. It's a really pretty figure. And then just to the right of it, um, upside down, there's a, another anthropomorphic figure with having kind of a wild hair day, but really deeply pecked eyes, um, which is, it's, you know, this is just a beautiful panel. And again, some interesting birds here on the far right and on the bottom left and, you know, really deeply pecked zoomorphs uh, in a line down there on the bottom. A really nice panel. So I know next to nothing about Navajo rock art, but this is my summary. In Utah, it's only evident in the extreme south corner of the state. Uh, from what I've seen, the anthropomorphs tend to be round-headed. They have long rectangular bodies, often with flared skirts. The horses, they have horses and buffalo. They have elaborate corn plants. They have the bow. And they have these yay figures, which are divinities or supernatural figures. Um, they use those a lot in their sand paintings. And so it's interesting to see them replicated in the rock art as well. And their rock art sites may include Spanish figures as well. So now we're going to jump into the Shoshone. And this is back to Nina. So when the Mormon settlers arrived in Salt Lake, they didn't face any resistance from the Utes or the Shoshone because this was a big no man's land in the Salt Lake area where they had agreed that nobody was going to use it. And that is, that is why the Mormons were able to settle there without too much trouble from the Utes or the Paiutes. Um, the Shoshone the Shoshone people were primarily located up in Idaho and Wyoming. And I know that there are Shoshones down there in California as well. Shoshone people traveled just extensively. Um, they were not necessarily growing crops anywhere. I know when the Mormons came down here into uh, the St. George area, there were some, uh, some little plots of corn that the Shoshone down here were growing. Uh, the Paiutes were growing um, the, in, along the Santa Clara River, um, and that's a Paiute trait, but not a Shoshone trait. The Shoshone traits just, I mean, their range was probably seven or 800 miles in a year. They would go north and south. I, I had, uh, there's one specific instance where my grandmother uh, had a woman who was Shoshone that would stop at her house on the way between Death Valley and Idaho. And she stopped there twice a year on her little route. And she said she kind of had a little running skip that she did to get from place to place. And this big skirt with pockets all over in it that had all kinds of stuff. So basically that's what I'm, I'm telling you is that the Shoshone traveled probably more than anybody else. They had really limited resources. And so they could use up those resources in a hurry, and that's why they moved around so much. Okay. Okay, then yeah, you Shoshone figures, the human figures, are pretty distinctive from Paiute. They used basically the same area and roamed around in the same area, but you can tell the Shoshone because they had these uh, stick figure people instead of these well filled out bodies. And they had this inverted V leg shape. Sometimes it was the bow-legged kind, but the majority of the time it was this V-shaped legs. And then um, I've seen quite a few of them that have these wild things going up out of their heads. Okay. Um, this is more typical of the Shoshone rock art that you would see in southern Idaho than it is in Utah, although this is down just over the border um, in Utah. They had a lot of shield figures, and so they have um, almost always it's a little tiny round head and a great big shield and the V legs. And they had these big shields because they could use them. Um, when you've got you, they've got the smaller shield because they needed to carry it on their horse with them. But these guys had these great big, huge shields, and and that is a diagnostic of the Shoshone. Okay. 
This panel is just the strangest thing. I believe that it's a bear or maybe buffalo that's this great big um, zoomorph. And um, after that was put on there, I think by earlier people, because there is older rock art on the same panel, then they then they put, uh, you, you've got your stick figure up above and you've got another stick figure looking thing um, off to the left. You've got a stick figure animal to the right. And then they just totally destroyed this thing by scratching all over the top of it. And this is the only instance I know of where this obliteration on an animal is, is as complete as this in Utah. Okay. Um, this is a, a panel that's up on the north end of the Great Salt Lake. Um, it's got a big open spiral and the big zigzaggy lines with the dot-centered circles. And uh, if you notice in the center top of the rock, it's got a great big grinding groove there. And, and this is in an area where there's quite a few of those. Um, and I think that they were, you know, processing their plants. This is right next to Willard Bay. Um, and so they were processing those plants that grow on the shores of the lakes. You can see how this is really, really faint. It's because it's a harder rock, it's really hard to make a, a petroglyph on this kind of a rock. Okay. Um, this, is, this is just the strangest thing. It's out, on the sh out in the Great Salt Lake area. And if you, it, I mean, it makes a perfect chair. You could sit down in this and it's, it, it just contours your body really well. But I was told by a Shoshone medicine man that this is, um, it, it's a music rock. And it definitely does have a musical tone to it when you hit it with something. Um, it also has that, uh, use of the edges kind of like the Paiutes did. So I'm not convinced that it was Shoshone, but that's what the guy told me is that it was Shoshone. Okay. Um, this is a, another instance of where, uh, you know, they just make these zigzaggy lines and these little animals and these little stick figures and just cover this rock with um, images that I think they are not as well executed as the Paiute. It, it doesn't appear to me that they took as much time um, with their imagery as the Paiutes did. Okay. This is another one of those stick figure people with the arms straight out, the animal right next to it. And that's pretty typical of the Shoshone. I think that um, that beautiful deer that's over there to the right was done earlier. Okay. So to wrap up Shoshone, it's found in the northwestern part of the state. I've seen just a tiny little bit of it in the St. George area. There's a little bit in the West Desert, maybe around Delta or to the west of, of Delta but they definitely were, my, you, you know, they're migrating north to south quite a bit. The figures are pecked or painted and tend to be fairly simple in design until later when uh, you get up into Idaho where they, I think they spend a lot more time up in Idaho because the resources were better up there over on the north side of the Snake River. They tend to be a lot more biographic. Um, they're showing scenes of hunting scenes and stuff like that. Uh, the shield-bearing warrior is really common up in Utah, but there aren't that many examples of that in Utah, down in Utah. Um, the stick figure anthropomorphs are often seen with the zoomorphs and the wavy lines, and that's about their total repertoire is, is just those few things. All right. Well, I'm grateful for Nina because if I didn't have her, the Paiute and the Shoshone sections would have been very, very short. Uh, so we're finishing up. This is our uh, fourth presentation. We're, we've done all of the styles uh, that I know of in Utah, basically the, the major ones.
I wonder about. But I thought it might be helpful to just have a little quiz and a review. So what I'm going to do is I've got three slides coming up and you can use your chat function if you go down to the bottom part of your screen. And I just want you to enter a one in chat if you think this is Puebloan, so it's Anasazi, late period Anasazi. Or if you think it's Fremont, enter a two. Or if you think it's Ute, enter a three. Oh, I should tell you where this is because that might help you. Geographic location is one of our diagnostics. So this is in the northern part of the San Rafael Swell. And while you're typing, you know, if we had, if we had Jesse Warner here, he'd be jumping up and down because he'd be noticing that there's a shaft of light coming out of this figure's mouth. And I don't think I was here on an auspicious day and I didn't even notice that that was happening until I was looking at this picture the other day. But it is kind of a fun fact. You know, it kind of looks like it's mixed between one, two, and three. <laughs> okay, so what, what are we looking at? Everybody's going in all the different directions? Yeah. All right, so um, I think this is Fremont and the San Rafael Swell, which I, I told a lot of you guys late, so some of you have may, may have already entered your opinions before that, that, but that's a good Fremont area. And it's got that upside down bucket head where you know it's a little wider at the top and narrower at the neck. We've got a trapezoidal body where it's wide at the shoulders and it narrows down to the waist. And what I think we've got here is this figure is carrying a shield and you see the shields kind of sometimes in two different ways. Sometimes the shield is solid and you don't see the body behind it. And so you just have a head sticking out of the top and legs sticking out of the bottom. This is what they call the x-ray motif where you're seeing through the shield and you're seeing the body behind it. So I think this is a Fremont figure. All right, let's try the next one. So enter a one if you think this is Barrier Canyon style. This is also in the Northern San Rafael. Enter two if you think it's Glen Canyon style five. We're going back to the very second presentation. Uh, and enter three if you think it's Great Basin Curvilinear. Looking like one pretty much is the winner so far. Oh, yeah, good. Barry Kane style is a good choice. So it's got um, long tapered bodies, um, often without arms and legs. Some of these have arms and legs and some of them don't. Um, it's generally, well, it's almost always. I, I don't know of a large pecked Barrier Canyon um, panel. So they're generally painted. Uh, David talks about how the left hand and the right hand side are, are uh, generally the same and that they have, uh, they seem to be very familiar and friendly with animals and there's often snakes here and we've got little teeny tiny sheep. Those sheep at the very top are probably about the size of your pinky fingernail. Uh, we've got birds flying up and down in between the anthropomorphic figures. We may have plants over to the far left. I'm not sure what those are, uh, but this is a this is a really great example of a, a nice barrier canyon panel. All right, so I saw this one. Uh, this is down in the kind of northern Cedar Mesa area kind of halfway between Blanding and the Bears Ears. I was out hiking with my sister and we'd been to a ruin and we were walking back and I saw this place and I said, we've got to go and look over there. And we hiked over and didn't see anything. And then we went around to the other side and here was this really pretty panel. So enter a one if you think it's Shoshone, two if you think it's Navajo, or three if you think it's Ute. Hmm. 
Looking like three is the consensus. Okay. And actually, I think this is a tough one. So it's in both the Ute and the Navajo regions. Uh, it's a little north of where the Navajo typically are, but they were certainly here. They, they, we know that they were up into Bears Ears and up into Elk. Um, uh, what Ridge. is it? Elk Ridge, thank you. Um, I think this might be Navajo, but I'm not sure about that. And one of the reasons that I think it might be Navajo is that the horse is that kind of stubby looking horse. And I think the Utes often had kind of more of a, a long necked horse. And then the other thing that Nina noticed when we were talking about this yesterday is that the anthropomorphs look like they have braids coming down the back of their head. So you'll see, um, this figure here, this figure here, uh, where was it? There was another, this figure here. Anyway, there's several of them that look like they might have braids coming down the back. And I don't, you know, I don't know if that's really a good cultural diagnostic or not. I haven't seen it in the Ute rock art, to be honest. I haven't seen it in the Navajo rock art either, but the Navajo tend to be facing forward, and so you wouldn't see it from the back. But anyway, I think that's interesting. So I think either Navajo or Ute is, if I, if I had to guess, if I was forced to make a decision, I would probably go with Navajo. And so the thing that um, you're using there as a diagnostic is one of the options, but the one option that you could go for you would be the bear paws that are up there top center. And those are more you than Navajo, I think. Absolutely. Yep. So I think so it could go either way, I don't know. Yeah, it's not always easy. And in that vein, we're finished with the exam, but let's go to one last panel and talk about it for just a few minutes before we close. So I'm sure almost everybody knows this one. This is Rochester Creek. It's one of the most famous panels in Utah. And again, it's a public site, so we can name it. And I don't know how many times I've been to this panel and I stare at it and I stare at it and I stare at it and I don't have a clue what style it is. So I thought we might end just by talking about Rochester Creek for a, a minute or two. Uh, first of all, it's interesting. There's a, at least um, a couple of different time frames here. We've got superimposition. So you'll see that the older figures are like this figure here and this figure here. And they seem to be kind of semi-packed, right? They're not solidly packed like a lot of the other figures are. I think this is probably a bear over here. Looks kind of that same kind of style. And I think this figure is the same. And so I'm also going to guess that this figure here is also the same, although it's a little bit more solidly packed. But so we've got of older figures here that are underneath. And if you look carefully, there's a, a lot more than what I've shown. And then we've got superimposition of newer figures on top of the older figures. And uh, I'm going to blow up uh, this area up here in the top for you just so that you can see it in a, in a minute. But what's interesting is that we've got this big, you know, rainbow kind of arc motif going on here. This is really common in this area of the San Rafael Swell. I'll bet we could find you 10 or 15 panels like this, you know, um, in, the, in this part of the swell that are Fremont panels uh, that have these, barrier, these arcing motifs here. So, you know, that would say, well, maybe it's Fremont, but I look at the anthropomorphs and there's, you know, there's not an anthropomorph here that I look at and I say, you know, that anthropomorph is clearly this style or that style. They all just kind of look like they're odd. 
So let's go on to, oh, I've got to click off here. So here's a blow up of that top section. And I think this is interesting. So a lot of people have wondered what that figure at the very top is. And I think when you compare it to this figure over here, it becomes pretty obvious that uh, I think it's definitely a bird and it's probably an owl. And so one is kind of a side view. The one on the left is a side view with the head turned and the one in the middle there is a front view. And you'll notice that that one in the middle is superimposed by the arcs. But even the arcs are kind of interesting because you'll notice that um, these kind of rain kind of things, you know, they look like they're coming out of this second from the bottom arc. But then you've got the very bottom arc, this one kind of coming along here, is superimposed over all of those rains, those rain kind of lines, and it's got its own straight lines coming out of it. It's just a lot of really interesting things going on here. And I don't know if, you know, there was some importance into how many arcs there were, and so they'd drawn one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines and, you know, done rain symbols. And then they decided, oh, you know, we need an eighth line here and, and had to superimpose over what they had done before. And then you can see again, another example of, here's one of these kind of partially pecked figures over here to the left. And it's superimposed again by all of these arcing lines. So one thing that I wanted to add to this is that this is where the stories come in. This is where anthropology comes in and ethnography. You, you have to know the story and you have to know the native use for the panel. And you get that sometimes by reading those things and you get that sometimes by talking to the people that know about it. And you get that sometimes by just being there enough that you figure it out yourself. And I think that's one of the main things about rock art is, although the, it's pretty pictures in a lot of instances, it goes way deeper than that. And you can take that just as far as you care to. You could, you know, you could be like me and spend 40 years trying to figure it out, or you can just enjoy it for the pictures that they are. And that's what's the beauty of rock art is, is you can take it at any level you wish to. So, and, and that is absolutely correct. I, I mean, we haven't really <clears throat> talked about interpretation. And that's, you know, whenever I give a public lecture, that's the very first question I get is what does it mean? And we have to talk about that. But, you know, interpretation is such a, a difficult thing because we li we live such a different lifestyle than they do and you know i think interpretation especially for us who are unfamiliar with their culture it's a really hard thing um okay some so some interesting things here um of course the the really interesting thing are these kind of crazy critters that are up here and those are just unlike anything that you see. Uh, I think we've got more owls here um, down in this area. And then we've got this little owl here maybe that's going up this line. And this line has various circles along it. And that line goes all the way from ground level to the very top of the rock. Um, you know, that's a, that's a really interesting figure that's here on this site. So just a lot of spectacular and interesting things going on here. So just to kind of summarize, I don't have a clue. And if somebody else knows what style this is i'd love to hear and i'd love to hear your argument for it i don't know a lot of times when i don't know and i see a lot of bears and i see a lot of owls 
I start to think about Ute. But every time I, <laughs> I say that when I'm at the person, they all look at me like I'm completely crazy. So I really don't know. I'm keeping an open mind, but this is a spectacular panel and it demonstrates that, you know, what Nine and I have done is we've looked through our pictures and we've found, you know, really clear, really nice examples of style. And we've done that for the last four presentations. But it's not always that easy. And you just kind of have to sometimes go with the flow and either say, I don't know, or make your best guess. Nina, do you have any concluding remarks? No, I think I've said about as much as I need to say. All right. Well, that is it for our presentation tonight, then. All right. Well, great. Thank you. Um, Everybody, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask, ask away. I think there is an answer. Unmute. How do I unmute? You're, you're unmuted. We can hear you. Oh, well, the time. Time is a long time. And all kinds of people live 30 years another generation 30 years another generation 30 years they do it this way 30 years later they do it that way why are we surprised at one place if they've used it for 500 600 years it wouldn't all be the same all the same style <laughs> to me um the um, Rochester Creek style is like. You're not on mute, so. Can you're you okay. Me? Yep, so, you're fine. There's a site, it's by the side of the road um, below the official newspaper rock site. Uh, you, you know, you walk up the hills, I forget the name of it. And the figures are extremely finely done. Do you know where I mean? That looks well, like down in Indian that's Creek, there's got to be a thousand Indian. panels down there, but yeah, so well, I don't, I don't know exactly which one you're referring to, but most of them have the same kind of a style, and and to me, that's what Rochester Creek style looks like. <clears throat> By the way, you get bonus points for wearing a Canada T-shirt. Thanks. <laughs> that translate into cash. <laughs> uh, well, no, it's just bonus points. <laughs> Thanks. I have a question for Nina. No. Okay. Didn't talk about um, Do you, let's let's let uh, let's let Je let's let Jeff ask his question first. We've got about three oh, people okay. talking at once. I'm sorry. Okay, am I on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Levan Martinau. Martinau. Yeah. yeah. What do you What do you think about his work in I terms think... of in terms of historic understanding of rock art? I think that Levan spent most of his life working on it, and it goes into great detail about gesture and posture and little things that most of us will probably never understand. Um, but, um, you know, I got a hold of Martino probably in the early 90s, and I've been working on that ever since. It's just complicated for me to understand, but I think he actually did know, you know, how to interpret a panel, but it would take him a very long time to do that. And so if, if we are expecting that we will ever know what LeVan Martineau knew, I, th I, you know, I think there's probably three people. It's just not, it's just so complicated that the majority of us will never get it. That's what I think. Yeah, yeah be, what kind of bothered me was he would bridge to the Fremont 
and and there was a a giant gap between the Fremont and the Numic peoples. <clears throat> so that really bothered me. He 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 did quite a bit of uh, traveling, and I think that confused him rather than clarified him. And that's kind of what I noticed when he died. He left probably a hundred three inch notebooks full of notes and we're still trying to go through those is pretty complicated wow interesting and so uh what what i find interesting is if you look at the severe valley fremont and you're in the severe valley then you, then you have you have the typical Fremont stuff, and yet you go up not very far, and it's Fremont again up in Grass Valley, where Kasherm is, but it's all painted stuff, and the figures are different. Right. So, so are we looking at Paiute, or are we looking at Fremont? With so the same Fremont people, because they were using pictographs at one place and petroglyphs at another place, would they change style? Yes. So what, what LeVan Martineau was trying to say is that there was a universal sign language and he was using the universal sign language to interpret his rock art panels. And I'm not sure that that's even possible to do. But when you're talking about Severe Valley Fremont versus Vernal Fremont, that's a whole different culture. And so yeah, yeah. It's, it's just- I'm talking, about, I'm talking about in the Severe Valley itself, it's, it's mostly all peck stuff with, with some exceptions. Right. But, and as soon as you go to Grass Valley, which is only 30 miles away, it changes to painting, all painted, and the figures are different, but it is considered Fremont. Also. So again, I, you know, I think it's complicated because, you know, the time periods are so long. So, you know, Fremont, let's say, you know, somewhere between 0 and 500 AD to about 1300 AD. You know, they were here for, uh, you know, 800 to 1300 years. You know, we as Westerners have been here for, what, you know, not even 200 years yet. Um, and so, you know, you may have had one person who was doing a lot of rock art in the area, and then 60 or 70 years later, maybe somebody else came and decided they want to do, do rock art and that first person was dead and they preferred to paint or they preferred to peck. And, you know, their style was a little bit different from the previous one. You know, I think, um, uh, you know, there, there, doesn't, there doesn't have to be uniformity across time and across artists, um, even if they are in the same region. Yeah, makes it interesting. Gary. So let's see what uh, Ben has to say. Did can, ben you go away? can you unmute yourself, Ben? Okay, how about Sue? I'm not sure Sue actually had anything. I think she was, yeah, she was just getting some background audio on Sue, I think. Okay. Yeah. That was a good call. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> Sue, I don't know what's going on with you, but your audio is uh, <laughs> incomprehensible. Sorry about that. Okay. 
Okay, Sue, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to mute you because we can hear something, but we don't know what's happening there. Yeah, helium. Yeah. <laughs> any, any other questions? Uh, yeah, I would love to be able to watch these again. How are, where are we at with that? So far, the first three have been posted on the YouTube uh, channel that I set up, and I, I've sent that out, and I can, you know, I'll, I'll put it in the messages that's going to come out probably in a week or so. I'll put the address in there again, so, but you can find them on YouTube, and I'll get this okay. one on YouTube in a couple of days. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sure. So I don't know what happened to it, but I had a suggested reading list. Uh, what happened to that, Troy? I've got it, but I didn't know, you know, it didn't seem to fit in the video, but I thought what we might do is I'd expand it and we could post it to the website. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So there will be some suggested reading for um, style only. It's not, it's not interpretation or anything like that. It's just uh, the books that we thought would be the most instructive on style. Most of which are out of print now. Yes. Ben, I see you've unmuted. Are you back? Oh, uh, yes, I'm back. Um, I, my question for tonight, I guess. We can't, we can't hear you, Ben. Uh, my question for Nina, am I coming through? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Now my question was about the Cave Valley style. I didn't mention it. Is it, can you attribute that to any particular time or group? I used to think the Cave Valley style was Paiute, but I'm having some second thoughts about that. Um, I see it. I see the style in Paiute, but it seems to be an early, early, early Paiute. And that's about all I can give you right now. I don't think it's Anasazi, although I have seen K Valley looking images that are down at Kayenta. Um, I, think, I think it's older than the oldest Paiute that I know of here. And so I'm not, I'm not sure about the cultural affiliation of it yet. Okay. Some of the paintings, though, like in Paiute Cave, are so bright. Um, they look like they've been refreshed. They do. And there's also, you know, the, the, the type site is in a cave and it's real well protected, but that's a little bit more um, repatinated than the, the Paiute Cave stuff. But no. when it comes to the packed cave valley style that's see, that's where it seems to have some real antiquity to it okay just i just thought i'd ask okay thanks thank you guys this has been fun thank you